Good afternoon and welcome to the Community Health Needs Assessment, Are You Ready for Your Annual IRS Evaluation Webinar? I'm Debbie Thompson and I'm President of Strategy Solutions and I welcome you to this webinar. Um, if you have any questions that you want to share, I have, I'm going to be muting. The conference has been muted. So I'm muting the line so I don't get a lot of background noise because I'm recording this for a few folks that weren't able to come. Uh, so I'm, if you have any, you know, if you have anything that you want to ask me during the course of the presentation, f please feel free to send it via the chat feature. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with me or Strategy Solutions, I describe myself to my clients as a recovering hospital planner. Please don't hold it against me. Um, but I've been working in, within the mission of creating healthy communities now for almost 20 years. I was the spiritual leader of the community health movement here in Northwest Pennsylvania during the 90s before a lot of folks were even thinking about community health. And one of the things I discovered during that time was the hospital system alone was never going to solve the community health equation, that it was really about systems and sectors and communities working together to create a healthier community, although healthcare does have a role in, in that process. Um, but I've really started, especially since I've been working a lot in the post-acute continuum of care um, and really helping to bridge what I call I'm now calling it out loud a Tower of Babel problem. Um, we, we, many people in communities want the same things, but because they work in a different sector, they speak a different language, and they don't really know that they want the same things because they're not using the same language to describe things, and they think other people want something else. So I've been working a lot to try to bridge that gap. Um, and today we're here to talk about these really two things, to learn how to approach program planning and outcomes measurement in order to evaluate impact. Those two words that were put in the IRS guidelines because they are, the IRS is ultimately going to require impact evaluation on these implementation strategies and then to determine, for you to, I, to give you kind of a checklist to determine how ready your hospital is to evaluate the outcomes and impacts of your implementation strategies because unfortunately my observation is that many of our hospitals are woefully unprepared and don't even know it to uh, begin to evaluate impact. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the observations that I have from working in different parts of the country as well as some of the things that I've learned from working in social services for the last 15 years that now begin to apply in the hospital realm in a different way. And we as hospital leaders now and healthcare leaders have to figure out how to connect the dots. And that's one of our most important imperatives right now this minute. So I'm starting off by talking about the IRS guidelines. Um, the letter of the law. When the guidelines were published, this is what a lot of people did. They got to recognize you've got to conduct this CHNA every three years. You've got to identify the chronic disease conditions and healthy community needs, look at assets and strengths, et cetera. But the spirit of the law, this is what I think they meant and not necessarily what they said. But the spirit of the law is clearly to create a population-based health planning and health care delivery system to focus our health systems on prevention and to move us in a, in a way that we're managing the health of the population to lower health care costs and improve health, that triple aim that is talked about. Um, and, and I have this in red here, depending on where you live, the state health department is already starting to scrutinize your outcomes as well as measure you on how well you evaluate the impact of the intervention strategies although we are still waiting to see how the IRS plans to approach compliance. So I have to tell you that what, what I'm presenting here is clearly the gospel according to Debbie Thompson, and I'm on my soapbox today because I'm a little worried about how prepared some of my hospital clients are to, be, to, to move in this direction and recognize that I, I'm not seeing a lot of folks kind of get off the dime. 
they're like, so, some folks are sitting around waiting for everyone else to sort of move forward and create a definition. And it's like, well, we're not doing anything until the IRS tells us to do something specific. Um, so stay tuned. So what I'm sharing with you today is some of the observations that I've made from working in different parts of the country and kind of reading the tea leaves based on the fact that I'm an old timer in healthcare. Um, yes, I started working when I was two, and you know I'm only 23, but I, I've actually been in healthcare now for about 25 years, and a lot of so. And I apologize to those of you who represent pretty large and sophisticated health systems that you're here to see a kind of as validation that we're doing this stuff right. Some of this is going to be very basic to you, and for those of you who say, yeah, I know this stuff, why are you telling me what I already know, I apologize in advance. I really pre prepared these slides for those people who are, are not really aware that this stuff is coming down the pike, and they need to be aware of it, because I think what's going to happen with the IRS to answer the first question, you know, how do I, what do I think is going to happen with the measurables, I think this whole effort is going to go the way of what we now know as HCAPs and quality initiatives. I remember back in the day when we didn't have patient satisfaction surveys in hospitals at all. My very first job in the first health system I worked for, I was actually hired with one mission to create a patient satisfaction survey process that worked. Okay, we had nothing. It was, we had nothing. It was so woefully inadequate. I spent the next couple years actually building a, a patient satisfaction survey process as well as a voice of the customer listening process so that we actually built programs and services in our organization that were things that people would buy. Um, that because we needed to shift market share, we were not in a good position in our market. We really took a kind of a, a consumer products, if you will, approach to um, thinking about program development even back then, and it was, it was just an important thing to do. But what my point about bringing up this story is we've evolved over the last 25 years to not just have patient satisfaction, but to have a standard patient satisfaction measurement tool or tools that we had to use and that our reimbursement is now tied to patient satisfaction. Oh my goodness, if somebody would have told my administrators that back in 1990, they would have said, you're nuts. We don't even know what this is. So look at how we've evolved. I also remember um, looking at healthcare advisory board materials about what is it meant to, to do a dashboard. We didn't have a quality dashboard. We didn't even know what that was. And now, we're, now we have standard things that we're measuring in every hospital across the board. I think that what's going to happen here over the next couple of years is the IRS is going to be watching. I don't think that they're going to be very specific and punitive at the individual hospital level over the next few years, although they might. Um, I, and you'll hear me talk a little bit about that as we go through this. They might. I think it's going to take them a while to get organized. I think they're going to be looking at what comes up in these um, needs assessments. I think they're going to be looking at what they consider to be the best practice needs assessments, the data they collect how they're done methodologically. I think that the guidelines for how a assessment is done is going to change to be more stringent and follow best practices. And I also think that they're going to watch how the best of the best are evaluating their outcomes and that they're going to be um, requiring the basics from everyone. And for those of you who are not ACHI members, I do think that the bar, where the bar is ultimately going to be for some organizations, is going to be kind of the meta-analysis of impact. Um, I heard one presentation at this year's um, ACHI conference uh, of a healthcare system that is actually evaluating their evaluations, which I thought was really cool. And they're coming up with a formula of how, where and how they're going to put their investment dollars based on how well the program or intervention actually does have an impact based on their criteria as a health system. Now, I mean, that's, that frightened me that 
we might evolve to that level. Now, again, back to my original apology for those of you who are more sophisticated. I'm going to talk about the basics here. What is, uh, the, uh, this is what the IRS says. This came right out of the, draft, the last draft guidelines that I'm aware of. In addition to describing the actions intended to address significant needs, that proposed rule has several requirements. The anticipated impact of these actions must be included as well as the plan to evaluate the impact. And then when you do your 990 every year, you've got to give an update on that impact. Okay? And again, the problem that I have with the, this last set of draft guidelines is that they did allow, they have no operational definition of what that means. And some of the things that people were proposing frightened me. Um, I do know that, but that I felt that they did a nice job of listening to the input that they had the last time around. And some colleague friends of mine from here in Western Pennsylvania, on behalf of Western Pennsylvania, um, the hospital council here in Western Pennsylvania, we actually submitted a specific set of proposed operational definitions to the IRS during their comment period um, that I'm actually hoping shows up in some of their guidelines. Because what we tried to do is we, tr and you'll hear me talk about this, we tried to take a rational approach to all of this without making anyone crazy, which I think is the best middle ground in the short run. And my encouragement for all of you on the phone that are tasked with thinking about how do I evaluate impact is to start moving down the direction of what will likely be required no matter what, just to start moving in this direction without necessarily you know, setting the bar so high for yourself in sophistication that you end up doing nothing because you, you can't get off the dime. So, with, you know, how do you, so I'm starting at the very basic question here. How do you evaluate impact? The way you evaluate impact is that you conduct a program evaluation. And if you are doing multiple programs, you conduct an evaluation of all of your different interventions together. But it is a process. And part of the problem that we have with nomenclature here is that the word evaluation is used as both a noun and a verb, and it's confusing. And during the course of this, and during the course of this presentation, I'm going to try to differentiate between the evaluation that's a noun, which is a process of determining whether or not you've had an impact, and the verb, which is the process of doing an evaluation. And again, I think that a lot of people are simply confused by the terms. So they're like, well, I'll wait till somebody tell, until my auditor calls me and says, this is what I need from you. My fear for you in the hospital business is that if you're waiting for your auditor to tell you what they need, it may be too late because you probably don't have the systems in place to give them what they need. So let's talk about what is a, let's talk about what do you do to actually evaluate a program and to conduct a program evaluation or a process to evaluate the impact of what might be a variety of intervention strategies that you have from your community health needs assessment. So I'm going to start with a very basic definition. What is a program evaluation? It's the systematic method of collecting information about projects and programs to assess, are they effective? Are they efficient? Did they do what we said they were going to do? Okay. So these are, so before we get into the nitty gritty of that, here's some questions to ask yourself to see how ready you are. First of all, are you actively implementing all of the strategies and programs identified in your community health needs assessment document? That's an important first question because, again, I know of some folks that put these wonderful plans in their documents, but they're going, uh, we haven't done anything with that. And it's three quarters of the way through the first fiscal year. And some people think, well, if I hire somebody to address those things, that's all I have to do this first year. And, and that may be okay. But that's the, that's the question. Are you actively implementing the things you said you were going to do? The second question is, do you have a mechanism in place to track 
measure and report on the outcomes and impact of those various strategies and programs beyond the number of people that attend or participate. And the reason why I say that is because in many of our community benefit programs and the way we've thought about community benefits is that, well, we track the numbers of people who attend. You know, we're doing this we're doing this uh, health fair or this screening program, 100 people showed up. Great. We did a nice community benefit. But what I've learned from being in this space already is that it is just not about the benefit the, or the community benefit. And intervention strategies, no one ever said in the IRS guidelines that the intervention strategies are limited to community benefit programs. Although some people are now suggesting that community benefit programs all be tied to some need identified in your plan, or it's not a legitimate investment of community benefit. Okay? Some states, like for, this, for example the state of Maryland that I will talk about later, is, is actually forcing their hospitals through what they have to report annually to cross-connect their implementation strategies and their community benefit work. But if you have no mechanism in place to track anything beyond the number of people that participate, um, then you may have a problem. Because are you tracking knowledge? Are you tracking the fact that you did a screening and these people actually showed up somewhere? If you're not doing anything beyond that, you should be thinking about how do I actually begin to measure those outcomes and impact and know the difference between output and outcome and impact, which I'll talk about in a minute, because the number of people that show up and whether or not they were satisfied with your program are output measures, not outcome measures. But I'll explain that in a few minutes. The third question is, have you attempted to compile the measurement data and create a report that includes all of the data somewhere? Again, my observation is that many hospitals have different people doing stuff. They're doing different stuff in different places. Many hospitals have not designated the person or persons to be the data collector, okay, from the implementation strategies. They have somebody doing data collection for community benefit. They're not looking at that as being the same people even though uh, for those of you who have like Lions tracking software, for example, um, they're adapting the tracking software to be able to collect data on outcomes and impact. You know, those are all great things, but if you don't have any of those mechanisms in place, you have to start asking yourself the question. The, last, the fourth question is, has your implementation team reviewed the compiled data to determine the extent to which your strategies and programs are actually achieving the intended results? Do you have an implementation team somewhere, whether it was your CHNA steering committee or an internal hospital team or your you know, population health team? I know some systems have those, have those internal teams that are doing that. Have you actually sat down and said, hey, we said we were going to do 10 things. We're doing great on these four. These other two were missing the mark, and we haven't even started these. Um, and I'll give you a, one example is, one of our clients has said that they're going to be doing teen pregnancy programming as part of their implementation strategy, but nobody's showing up for the teen pregnancy programs. So that's a problem. Um, and, and it's a problem that needs to be addressed as part of the evaluation process. And then my last question is, if your answer to any of these questions is no, do you have a plan to ensure that this stuff begins to happen? either at the end of the, by the end of the fiscal year or shortly after the end of the fiscal year. And my concern for you is that if you haven't had any of these conversations and don't have any of these systems in place at all, you may be going back when you start to fill out your 990 and you're looking for information that doesn't exist. And the re it's May. Um, the good news is you may be able to get some of this stuff done before the end of the fiscal year or be, you know, start to put some things in place even if you don't have them all done now. So that's why we're here. So why do this thing called a program evaluation? Here's why. It ensures transparency and accountability. You measure the outcomes and impact. 
you're informing those who provide and administer programming. It forms the basis of future programming. And, and here's my observation, again, about the hospital folks that I've been working with. You folks are all doing this. Your clinicians are doing it on the fly. You're evaluating everything that you do. And you're saying, oh, this wasn't working. I'm going to change it this way. This is working. This is what I'm doing. The problem is that you're not writing it down. And you don't have data to support often what I call the anecdotal gut fill evidence that the person running the program is actually thinking in their heads. You're not engaging others to look at what have we done in the past and does it work or not. That process isn't formalized anywhere. You're sort of doing it on the fly. And if you talk to people involved in the programs, they know exactly what they're doing and how they're doing it, and they're evaluating what they're doing. The problem is it's not written down anywhere, and there may not be any data to support it. Or they have the data somewhere over here, but they're not thinking, oh, gee, that's data that actually demonstrates the fact that my implementation strategy is working. So a lot of this effort, again, is connect the dots. But what I found is that many of my hospital colleagues and hospital clients don't know how to connect the dots in the framework of a program evaluation, again, without some outside help. So that, again, that's why we're here, because I think it's important for all of you to know this. Now there's a couple of different types of evaluation. The first type of evaluation is a formative evaluation, which aims to improve the program structure or the implementation. If you are just getting a new program off the ground as part of your implementation strategy, you ought to be thinking about doing a formative evaluation um, as during your year one or the, the first couple years of your program. If you are looking at at the end of a, at least at the, maybe at the end of a year or at the end of your three-year period, you ought to be looking at a summative evaluation, which assesses the merit or the worth of the program. And most of us do programs on an annual basis, okay? And if we think it's doing well and it's making an impact, we'll do it again. So you are probably informally evaluating what you're doing. What I'm suggesting to you that that summative evaluation process become an explicit intentional thing that you sit people down in a room together and have a conversation about. And then there's a thing called a developmental evaluation where it's intended for situations where it's acknowledged that the program and the organization are constantly changing. So we're trying to look at documenting things as they happen or how they're happening while we're developing a new program so that we can think about what we're going to do when we replicate it at the end of either a pilot period or at the end of some time frame. So those are the different types of evaluation. Now let me also say to you, I, I have to put this caveat on this, that I am a very I take a balanced approach to research and data collection and applied. I'm more an applied scientist than I am an academic um, scientist and purist. Um, not everything needs a double-blind study with a, con you know, a experimental group and a control group. Not everything needs that. But some things might. Um, so you really need to be balancing the need to know and the information you need to have and the proper data collection methods and analyses. And I'm kind of a practical researcher in that way. I try to take a balanced approach, and especially for things that don't require a lot of you know, methodology or thinking, I sort of use the practical approach to data collection. Uh, my company has also created a collaborative relationship with the American Institutes of Research in Washington, D.C., um, which is a, a think tank research evaluation organization that has 1,500 PhDs, pretty much in any discipline that you might ever want, to be the, what I would call the technical uh, expert when, um, and, and I use them and refer my clients to them when I feel that they need 
um, academic level research acumen on different, whatever the discipline is or the type of uh, program evaluation. Because I have had numerous clients in the social service sector get bad science because they hired, just because, and I, if any of you have PhDs after your name, this is not, my statement is not meant to be disrespectful. But um, I have seen clients hire folks just because they have a PhD, but they don't know how to technically evaluate the quality of their work. And I've actually seen people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on what they thought was research and evaluation that they got no product at the end. So um, I'm very sensitive to that because I actually had a, a client go out of business, a nonprofit organization go out of business because they squandered a lot of money on that and nobody could evaluate the technical competency of the research that they were doing. It was, it's very tragic. Um, so that practical approach is very important. Now, some additional terms. The evaluation here, that's a noun, okay, is the systematic investigation of the merit worth or significant as a knowledge or effort. And the program could be anything that's being evaluated, okay? So program may be, I'm using the word program to mean any action with the goal of improving outcomes for either communities or specific sectors or for subgroups. And the definition is meant to be very broad, but I, I'm using it, to, a program is any type of intervention that you might be doing as part of your community health needs assessment activities. Um, now that said, and I do need to give credit for where I got some of this information, um, there, and I have the, the website cited later, there's actually a wealth of information um, from the CDC on some of this program evaluation lingo and how to think about it. Um, there are different types of programs, um, direct service interventions, community mobilization efforts, research initiatives, surveillance systems. Your implementation activities might be, you might have one of all of these, or you might have some intervention programs, or you might have a training program, or you might have something that's a direct service intervention. And again, what I found is that my hospital clients can't often differentiate between those things. But you could be doing advocacy work. Um, which on a social cause, for example, one of my clients is doing a social cause marketing campaign um, because they found that the seatbelt use in their county has gone down, their motor vehicle crash rate has gone up, and they are really mounting through their um, local community health improvement district the, the effort to try to get more people to wear seatbelts again. Um, because young people haven't had you know, all of those mothers against drunk driving sort of social cause marketing drilled into them that you've got to wear a seatbelt. Um, and Mothers Against Drunk Driving actually did the advocacy work to get seatbelt law, seat laws passed back in the day that made a significant effort, made a significant impact on, on society at large in terms of some things that we practice today as a society in the United States that we didn't do 30 years ago. So you have to think about what kind of thing am I evaluating first? The other thing you have to do is think about whether your evaluation measures are process and output, or are they outcome, or are they impact. Process and output ask, are we reaching who we reach? The number of people, program strengths and weaknesses, feedback and satisfaction are all output measures. Outcome measures are the knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, or other changes to other variables that happen as a result of the program, okay? Like, for example, if we're doing a teen pregnancy program and one of the outcomes that we want is to decrease rebirth rates, okay? We want to we intervene with girls, young people who have had one child that, that have a teen birth so that they don't have a second. Um, so, you know, are we actually changing their attitudes toward things like having another child before they're 20? And then the impact, what are the long-term changes that are the result in the changes in the outcome variable, okay? Have we actually decreased the diabetes rate? Have we actually increased the obesity rate in the, either the population that we're serving or in the county as a whole? 
Um, and the new impact question, which I hear from stakeholders and funders every time I talk to one of them, is this. How does the program save the system money? Are we actually doing things by, through our diabetes medical home intervention that saves on readmission? Are we saving on admission rates related to train wrecks? Have our stroke rates gone down um, as a, you know, for people? These are the things that we need to be thinking about. So these, you have to, and as you start to think about, well, how do we measure this stuff? Because many of us are ill-equipped to measure anything beyond the number of people that participated in the program. We have to be thinking about the, what kind of data do we need to make inferences about the program. And we have to recognize that it's garbage in, garbage out. If we don't set up the process well by setting up um, the, the, the right variables, the outcomes, measures, et cetera, we may never have any data. Um, so you really ought to have, and if you don't have a logic model created for every one of your program interventions, you ought to create it. And what is a logic model? A logic model is a graphic representation of if-then statements that is a series of relationships and becomes the program roadmap. And a lot, you know, some f programs have logic models, some don't. But the logic model exercise forces you to think about what do we really need to measure. Um, and some people have this approach to logic models, give us money, we all win. This is the simplified approach. But it doesn't really work in today's environment. And, while, and I'm going to talk, the next couple of slides actually talk a little bit about lo creating logic models. And what I found with most of my clients is that they can tell me about the program and I can actually complete a logic model while I'm listening to them talk. And, and, and that, you know, the inputs are the resources that go in, the outputs are the activities that we undertake, the outcomes are the things that happen. Here's a very simple logic model. I'm hungry. That's the condition, the problem I want to solve. I get food. That's my activity. I eat food. That could either be considered an activity or a short-term outcome. The short-term outcome of getting food is eating it. I'm, that's a, a short-term outcome. And the longer-term or intermediate outcome is that I feel better. I mean, if I eat the right food, the impact might be that I might be healthier over time. But that's beyond the scope of this basic little logic model. What I like about this particular slide is that it gives you the kinds of things that belong in each box. The inputs are the things we invest. The outputs are what we do and who we reach. The short-term outcomes are things like knowledge, awareness, attitudes. Medium-term outcomes are actions, typically, or the intent to change behavior. That can also be considered an outcome. And the fact that I did change my behavior. You know, if I'm in a diabetes education program and my intent is to change my eating habits, that intent, that if you got me to say that by the end of the program, is actually a really good thing. And here's an example of some process outcomes and impact measures. I'm just looking at things a, a little bit differently. Um, you know, my understanding of the relationship between physical activity and diabetes could be the outcome of the diabetes education program. But you have to have a mechanism at the end of your diabetes education program to measure that my understanding actually increased, either a pre- and post-test survey or some way of knowing that it, it actually changed and increased. And then the impacts are things like decrease in the cost associated with diabetes care, the in decrease in hospitalization. And I also want to say to you that you should be thinking in the short run, especially in the first year. You shouldn't necessarily be, unless you have you know, 35 different players in, commu in your community all implementing the same obesity intervention program, you should be thinking at this point more about are the programs I, I'm doing impacting the population that I'm serving and not necessarily worrying so much about am I impacting the diabetes rate in my service area or in my county because you're probably not going to evaluate that longer-term impact 
until your next community health needs assessment. Um, but you might be able to depending on your implementation strategies. But more often than not, those short-term evaluations are looking at the programs and the interventions that you're doing and saying, are they making a difference in the population that I think I'm serving? I also, I'm also throwing in a pitch for this book, um, which is one of the best books I've read on this topic. Um, I actually use this text. This is a book that I use. It's a paperback. It comes from Sage Publications. It's called Designing and Managing Programs, an Effectiveness-Based Approach. I use this book as a textbook in a program um, development and evaluation course I teach at Duke University. This is a great book. If you haven't, it, it really is, for those of you who need more of a primer on how to think about this, um, the book is a great, I recommend actually getting it and reading it. It would be a great resource for you. But an effectiveness-based approach, and this is what, if we're evaluating impact in the spirit of what the IRS is saying, the effectiveness-based approach is actually um, suggesting that you produce a clear understanding of the problem to be addressed. This is the thing we're trying to intervene on. You measure client problem type at severity at entry. You measure it again at exit. And you look at the indicators in between to say, has my program achieved the results it has? Okay? And the thing I like about the book is that, and one of the things that I'm going to send you, part of my toolkit, I actually took the book. I have this, I actually do the Cliff Notes versions of books. And I actually took the various chapters of this book in terms of problem analysis and needs assessment. And I created a worksheet. I, it's it's a, like a 27-question worksheet. It's, it, but if you walk through those questions, it will actually take you through the rubric of the developing the hypotheses, thinking about who you want to serve, what the program design are, and what the variables are that you should be measuring. So that by the time you ask yourself all of those questions, de actually developing the logic model should be very simple for you. Um, so I will send you that toolkit. Um, I'll send you that as part of the toolkit because for those of you who have never done this before, that could be very helpful for you. Um, so those are the things, if you're thinking about a new program, these things on my last slide, these are the questions that you have to ask yourself as you get started. Um, but if you already have a program that has all of those things done, you want to say, what will be evaluated? What's the criteria that I'm using to judge the program performance? What are the standards of performance on the criteria that have to be reached? And what evidence will indicate performance on the criteria relative to the standards? And what conclusions about program performance are justified based on the available evidence? Um, and I, again, I'm going to do another pitch. I, I actually took these. The source of what is the next seven or eight slides actually comes from the University of Kansas Community Toolbox. And I'm citing these toolbox, and I'm going to send you, if you want more information, send you to their website. Because they do a very nice job of explaining the CDC materials and making them digestible for you, that you could actually use them to help do your own, your own evaluation. But here's an example. What will be evaluated? Drive Smart is a program focused on reducing drunk driving through public education and intervention. Okay, you may have a teen pregnancy program. You may have a diabetes education program. Doesn't matter. You have to. What, what's going to be evaluated? Okay, what criteria is going to be used to judge the program performance? The number of community residents who are familiar with the program. Okay, the number of people who use the Safe Rides volunteer taxis to get home so they're not drunk driving. Um, the percentage of people who report drinking and driving. That's another indicator. Uh, the reported number of single car nighttime crashes, okay, that motor vehicle crash death rate, okay, those, those are the criteria. Okay, what are the standards of performance? These are the targets or the objectives. If you've been talking to or listening to evaluation metrics, um, the, you know, evaluation metrics, uh, you can, um, Look at, you know, 20, you, you want to make your objective smart, specific, measurable, accountable, 
realistic and time delineated. 20% of the community residents will know about the program and its goals after the first year of the program. The number of people who use safe rides will increase by 20%. The percentage of people who report drinking and driving will decrease. So you want to set some target goals for yourself. And the first year, I tell my clients this, the first year you're doing a program, you setting the targets might actually be a goal for you because you may not you may feel uncomfortable saying you know i don't even know whether a good number is but it's okay to set a number even if it's high you know say you say 80% and you find out that only 20% work you can say part if part of your evaluation maybe our goal was too high that's okay okay the whole exercise here is designed so that you can so that you are evaluating what you're doing and talking about how do you make it better. Nobody is judging you on whether or not you hit the 80% goal that you set. Okay? This is not an um, evaluation of the program itself. Is the, it, the question that the IRS is saying is, are you setting up a process to determine if you are going to make a difference over time. And somebody asked me a question during the chat feature, how, where can we get access to the recorded webinar? I'd like to send it to some colleagues. Let me jump in and say two things. First of all, um, if you want the recorded webinar, uh, send, you, know, you want to send Kathy an email to say, send me the recording, because we're not sending everybody the recording necessarily. If you really want it, Kathy will send it to you. You just have to ask it. When she sends you the toolkit stuff, ask her for the recording. Secondly, is if sometimes the best thing to do is to actually do this presentation for a group of colleagues at your particular facility. Okay? I'm happy to redo this. If you'd like me to do a webinar just for you, because we need to get folks on the same page and spend some time with me talking about it after the fact, I'm happy to do that. Um, so, because I'm, I'm a, really, I believe in this so strongly. And if you really need some help, you know, we can set up some cost, really cost-effective assistance programs to just react to and give you some technical assistance on the things that you need. We don't have to set up a multi-million dollar consulting contract, which is what some people are afraid of. Oh my God, I can't afford a $50,000 consultant. But sometimes just a little bit of help or a little bit of coaching or a, you know, I have one client that actually had me come on site, you know, pay, essentially paid me for a day of consulting to come and educate their senior leadership about how to think about this and then work with the program managers of how to set it up. That's possible to do too and can be quite affordable. Um, so, you know, that, you know, that's again something to think about. Um, what evidence, the next question is, what evidence will indicate performance on the criteria? A random telephone survey will demonstrate community residents' knowledge. And here's where we've got the hidden cost in all of this. Okay? For my hospital administrator friends that are still stinging from the unfunded mandate that required you to do a community health needs assessment process in the first place, Here's the other thing the IRS isn't telling you. Yes, you have to invest in the measurement and evaluation process. And this is unfunded. But what you should be doing as an individual health system and as, as a community, you ought to be thinking about how it is that we measure the impact of what we do. And one of the reasons why many health systems are hiring informatics specialists is because we have to figure out how to get at this impact data. We have to figure out how to go through our medical records from three or four different databases and figure out how to put it together into a file that can then become the reporting document on this stuff. This is the price of admission for moving toward population-based health planning. We're going to have to invest in it eventually what the IRS is doing is saying, okay, folks, we're doing our part to make you think about this now. Now, then the next question is, what's conclusions about program performance can, are justified based on the available evidence? Are the changes we're seeing, should, they, should the Drive Smart program change? 
Um, or, or is there no sufficient change in the outcome? Okay? That, those are the questions we have to ask ourselves. And then here's the framework for the evaluation process. Again, this came from the same Community Toolbox website, and I love it. It's a great resource. Um, the steps in the program, uh, the actual program evaluation are these. Engage stakeholders. Describe the program. Think about the evaluation design. Gather credible evidence. Justify your conclusions. And ensure the use and that the lessons learned are shared. And here's, here's the, how you do it engage stakeholders. The stakeholders are people or organizations that have something to gain or lose. There are three types of them. People involved in the program. You can get their feedback through a satisfaction survey or through a focus group of participants. People served um, or affected by the program. Um, these are the, you know, the folks that actually participate. Um, the intended users of the evaluation are people who might be the decision makers at your health system about whether or not we're going to continue to do this community benefit program. And you have to engage them in some way, either by doing a, asking them questions, doing interviews, inviting them to a meeting where we talk about it, and then you know, use an audience polling system to evaluate what we're doing. Describe the program. The, the, the statement of need, the expectations, the activities, the resources, the stage of development, the context, the logic model. You need to write these things down in the beginning. And if they're not documented, you should document them as part of your evaluation. We need to look at the evaluation design. We want to gain insight, improve how things are done, determine the effect of the program. So how are we going to know from the data that we have? We might have to actually go out and collect the data. We want to actually gather the data to assess the skills development by program participants. In other words, did the stuff that I taught them actually stick by the end of the program? Um, one of the things that we've been doing is helping to um, create tools at the end of a training program for people to assess whether or not they actually learned anything. Um, compare changes in behavior over time. Yes, we have to track people over time. And, and, and I found, and I'll use diabetes programs, the people that are running the diabetes programs are talking to a cohort of people over time. They may actually be collecting that data. However, they're collecting the data. It's on a paper record in the diabetes educator's file. It doesn't really help me unless we do something with, we figure out how to create a data collection and reporting system for that on a macro basis. Decide where to allocate new resources, look at the accountability requirements, use information from multiple evaluations to predict the likely effect of similar programs. Okay? We have to gather credible evidence. Um, Evidence should be seen by stakeholders as believable, trustworthy, and relevant to answer their questions. Okay? In other words, if you have bad data or it was collected poorly, people may say to you after the fact, this, isn't good. this is not a good evaluation plan. Sources of evidence could be people, could be documents, could be observations. Part of the program evaluation might need to be that the clinicians or the diabetes educator has to go back through all of those clinical records and say 80% of my clients actually met 60% or more of their outcomes. They might have to do that manually. Um, so, but you have to think about it. Here's a long list of techniques for gathering evidence. I'm not going to read this to you. You could read it later once you get the presentation. A lot of these things can be used as data gathering. Again, you could do 75 things to gather data. But what I'm suggesting is to you that you do the one or two most important things that will help you say, is this program making a difference? You want to justify your conclusions. Create a standard for judgment, analysis, and synthesis of the data. Do some type of interpretation, and then judgment and recommendations. And what I'm suggesting to our clients is that you pull a team of people together at the end of the fiscal year and you go through all of your interventions and the data that you've collected and then make a judgment call. Is it working? Is it not working? Interpret the data that you have. And do the best you can. You don't have to make it, it doesn't have to cost a million dollars, but you have to go through some kind of a process 
even if it's a meeting or a series of meetings where you talk to the people who were involved in the program that can't come to the meeting, and you write it all down. And you document what you talked about in that evaluation meeting so that you can move forward. Um, it, it really doesn't have to be complicated. Um, and we've, we've done things like use Zoomerang surveys to ask people who were involved in the program whether they thought it made a difference or not. So that kind of stuff can inform your conclusions. But somebody who was involved in the program needs to use that data. You, you should have somebody designated as kind of your internal evaluator. Maybe it could be the person who is the facilitator of the process for you. It could be your community benefit coordinator. It could be somebody who is you know, in your planning department somewhere. But you want to have somebody facilitate that discussion for you so that you can collect the data, have somebody make some draft recommendations based on what you know. Um, uh, okay. And then presenting options instead of directed advice. And somebody asked me a question. We are using evidence-based programs for diabetes education that already demonstrated changes in hospitalization, et cetera. Do we have to measure that too? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And not only should you be measuring that program, you should be measuring your fidelity to that evidence-based program, okay? Because it, you should be comparing what you're doing and what your outcomes and impacts are to what the b benchmark is in the evidence-based program. Because you may be doing the program, but you may not be doing it in the same way that it was evidence-based, okay? Do I have to send follow-up forms even though the main study already demonstrated that? Um, I think that depends on what your outcomes are supposed to be. If the, if, and what you're trying to achieve in your own implementation strategy. Because it really, you have to make some kind of a, you, you know, you have to know that the program is working um, in your local area. Um, you can measure that by the time they're done. It may not have to be longitudinal because, again, if, you, if you're meeting the benchmarks during the course of your program and your evaluation lines up with the benchmarks, you could probably make the case that, well, I don't have to follow these people over time uh, because that, you know, this is an evidence-based program, I know it works. But what I'm here to say to you is that you probably ought to be thinking about where those people are. If you're doing a diabetes education program, where are they in your primary care physician's network? What, uh, and, and what are those primary care physicians doing to ensure that that continuity of care continues to happen? Because as time evolves and we move more toward bundled payments and value-based purchasing strategies, your hospital system is going to have to have a mechanism to track those kinds of things across the continuum of care by person maybe you ought to think about creating those systems now. And this is the strategic question that this whole process is begging from the IRS, but isn't necessarily explicit in the IRS regulations yet. So, uh, and again, you know, a lot of it is going to depend on what those final guidelines say from the IRS. And what I tell all of my clients is right now, the the quality of the assessment of these things is really in the eyes of the beholder. The person who cares about this right now or who is going to care about this is the auditor or the person who is actually completing your 990 Schedule H. Okay? I know some auditors that are looking for very specific information about implementation strategies and how they connect it to the community health needs assessment. I think those same auditors are going to be looking for where's the evidence that showed me that you actually did some impact. And I'm going to suggest to you, if you've never done this before, the state of Maryland, the state of Maryland, their evaluation framework is here on the, on the page. You know, what was your identified need? What was your initiative? What was the primary objective? 
Was it a single year, a multi-year time frame? Who was your partners? How were the outcomes evaluated? Did you go through a process of actually looking at the data and saying, I achieved this? Because merely implementing an evidence-based program um, that, you know, does that make a difference, okay? And the, the person that I was chatting with said, we do changes in exercise behavior, confidence gain with various problem solving skills, and those are good short term outcomes. Absolutely. If you have those if you have that data, you show the outcomes. Over time with the same program, you might have to be starting to ask yourself, is this making an impact? And then am I going to continue the initiative and what does it cost? Now, this in Maryland the folks, the hospitals in Maryland have to fill this out, all of their community benefit interventions. Um, I, you should be doing this, it, but I'm telling you that the IRS never said anywhere that a community intervention, a community health needs assessment inter intervention has to be a community benefit. In other words, you could make money on the implementation strategies that you're doing and use them as part of the evaluation. And my favorite example is the one from my friends at Excella Health here in Pennsylvania. They do mammogram screenings, and they count the number of people who come to the health fair. The number of people who get mammogram screenings, screenings at the health fair is a short-term outcome. They give vouchers for free mammograms for people who can't afford it. So the number of the vouchers they give and then the number of those women who actually show up for a mammogram and the number of women who schedule mammograms at the event is also an outcome because they have their mammogram schedulers right there so they can schedule the outcomes. Okay? Now the impact is really the number of women who are diagnosed in stage 0 or 1 breast cancer. So they may do, can I track that? Sure, they can track that. That information exists somewhere in their information system. They have to figure out how to get it out and how to track the women who actually came to the screening process and went through the, the, you know, went through the whole thing. So these are sort of strategic data collection questions that you have to ask yourself and determine how do I really want to, you know, how do I really want to do this? Um, I put here a timeline for a possible evaluation process for you. For those of you who have never done this before and who said, you know, gee whiz, I don't know if I can do this, this is what you want to do. Implement your programs to the end of the fiscal year. During the month of July, compile all your output and outcome data, analyze and interpret it, schedule some meetings to get input from the people involved. In August, interview those stakeholders, conduct a focus group to discuss the data. In September, convene the project teams to review the data and the stakeholder input and, and draw conclusions. And then on October, prepare the statements for the 990 Schedule H. Because for most people, they're due in November. Now, in some cases, you know, if your fiscal year ended in July, in, I mean June 30th, the 990 Schedule H is actually due in November, which means that most people are scrambling around in September or October going, where's my data? How do I fill this out? Some health systems get an extension on their 990, so they're actually not filling it out till May of the following year. Please don't wait until May of the following year to go, I don't know if I got any data. I don't know if I can go back and look at it. Um, so where do we go from here? When you get the copy of the presentation from Kathy, you know, look at my timeline, feel free to use it, use the resources that I talked about, ensure that each of the implementation strategies and programs that you have are actually being implemented, establish outcomes and impact measures, develop a progress report format, please don't wait till the end of the year, facilitate a discussion of what working is not working and next steps, and call us for assistance on any of those if you're stuck. Because I have one client that says, I'm so grateful I have my Debbie. I don't have to worry about any of this. Because, and it was, you know, we, we, we are helping her with all of those steps of the process. And their health care system, we set up the framework, we're helping, we set up the evaluation tools where they didn't have them. We're helping them, we're actually going to help them conduct an evaluation at the end. But we can do any of the pieces and parts, and if you just, oh my God, I don't know what to do with this, please feel free to call me, you know, sort of quick questions are easy. 
um, and I'm happy to help you with that. Um, and again, I also have a kind of a two-page newsletter article that describes all of what I just said in kind of a summary form. If you feel you need your, to get some of your higher level administrators on the bus, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm happy to do this webinar for anybody who you know, needs it and we can schedule it. I'm also happy to, um, you know, again, give you the toolkit and help you on your own or get you the recording of this if you have some folks that you need to have educated back at the ranch. And um, you know, I'm also happy to talk with any of you who feel that you could benefit from some consulting assistance. Uh, we're happy to help you with you know, as much or as little as you need. And you know, we really design our, in our intervention assistance to help you just get past your stuck place and help you to get um, moving with what you need to do. And with that, I'm going to say um, thank you for your attendance and participation today. And if there's any questions, I will unmute everybody. And the conference has been unmuted. Um, and feel free to ask in whatever time you have left to stay on the phone. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes, I do. Um, we have patients that come to our diabetes education programs in the community that may not be having services at our hospital. Right. So other than our evaluation form that we do pre and post workshop, what is another way to demonstrate effectiveness? Well, um, you can actually ask them, you know, you can ask them to do self-report, okay, so which says, you know, take this survey home and figure it out and, you know, do it in six weeks. Some of it, some of it is, um, you know, you, you may not be able to do the follow-up, you know, as well as you can to look at how does it, how does it feel, play longitudinally. Then, and if you can't do that and you don't have the resources to do it, I think your best strategy is to look at what you can do with the time that you have with people and what is it that you are doing that could possibly make an impact. Um, you know, the other thing that I'm, I'm suggesting to people, and, and a lot more and more hospitals are starting to create um, like customer relationship management through their website portals, you can actually start to get creative and do surveys like that. Get people's email addresses and ask them if you can email them a survey. Um, but again, I would not worry about it too much if you really can't longitudinally follow them. Just focus on the outcomes and the impacts you can make over the course of the program and be very specific. If, if you really can deliver an intent to change behavior, count that as your program outcome during your diabetes education program, okay? And I would also say if you have the ability to follow some subset of those folks that are your patients, I would encourage you to follow them if you can. But if you can't, I simply wouldn't worry about it and focus on the outcomes that you can measure in the context of the program that you are able to deliver. Um, I had one program evaluator say, the thing we have to remember is that that we are evaluating the program and our intervention strategy. We are not evaluating whether we solved all the world's problems. Even though the hope is that over time, if we do these things well and we get more community partners doing the same kinds of intervention strategies, that we will, in fact, over time, impact diabetes in our county. I hope that answered your question. I got a little bit on my soapbox there. But I, you know, part of it is if you don't have the resources to do longitudinal assessment, don't even try. Do the best you can with the resources that you do have. I mean, we do reunion luncheons where we actually invite them back and oh my goodness. a six-month to a one-year questionnaire. However, the return rate's pretty low. So out of 150, I'll get maybe 50 evaluation form. I'm sorry, 150 invitations. We get 50 that come. 
Right. right. It's a small subset again. So. Yeah, but that small subset, you have a captive right. audience of those 50 right. people. Get them to fill out a questionnaire while they're sitting there. We do. We do that. Okay, we do that as well. But again, it's self-reported versus actual. So the patients right. who are actually part of our center, I can go in and cross-reference that against a medical record. But right. the patients that are not part of our center, it's all self-reported, and I think that tends to have some pitfalls, but we just do the best we can. Right. Sure it does. And I think that, you know, again, you know, we're going to be evolving this stuff over the next 20 years, okay? This is a stay tuned. 20 years from now, we're going to look back and go, oh, my God, I remember a time when we didn't have HCAF. Okay? So, I mean, this is going to be a journey that we're on. It's just not going away. Um, it is not going away. And, you know, more and more we're going to have, and, and I think that each hospital system is going to have to start to think about, you know, where do I put my resources? You know, one of our clients hired an informatics specialist who has done a great job of getting data, getting data to their doctors out of the medical records on, the labs and the A1C levels for diabetic patients, that these reports like that come, I talked about this in the last webinar I did, these reports come to the doctor's office in the morning and it's like the doctors are like, where's my report? Because it, it sort of gives a profile on where the patient is um, based on things that they've done and, and the, the lab tests and the tracking. Um, but, but we're going to have to in, start to invest in these kinds of systems. And you have to, you know, small hospitals are at a disadvantage because they don't have the resources that some of the larger systems do. But so, and some of the larger systems, I noticed, have a lot of stuff in place, but they're not necessarily connecting the dots well across all the resources that they do have. But again, you know, back to my balancing a practical approach with good science, You've got to just look at it and do the best you can. And I don't think, you know, again, back to the very first question, I don't think that the IRS is going to be scrutinizing anybody to say, I set a program goal that 80% of the people are going to have this. Nobody is going to be looking over your shoulder yet and saying, you know, okay, XYZ hospital, did you get 80%? Where's the 80%? Why didn't you get the, why didn't you get that? I don't think anybody's going to be doing that. I think it's going to be more like what Maryland is doing and saying, are you looking at the stuff? Are you assessing what worked and what didn't work? Are you trying to make it better? Are you trying to make a difference in the lives of the people that you're serving? I think that's what the whole point of this whole exercise is. Um, and again, back to my soapbox, I think many of you are already out there doing it. I see it every day. My frustration is that this is a new language. This is a new way of thinking about it that we were never taught in hospitals. And I wouldn't know about it if I didn't work in social service for the last 15 years, which is part of why I'm so passionate about making sure that this information is available to you and trying to help you connect the dots. But, and I've learned from some of my clients that even if they have, a, you know, that they're not equipped unless somebody shows them how to do it. And we do that capacity building training to show you how to do it so you won't need us next time around, um, which kind of makes us a little bit unique as, a, as a, a consulting firm because we're not trying to, we're sort of gap fillers. We don't try to, you know, keep ourselves employed forever necessarily. Um, because I used to be in your shoes once upon a time. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? I am going to stop the recording.